In the Woods by Tana French begins with a horrible crime. Three children are playing in the woods. Only one comes out, covered with blood and with no memory of what happened that day. Twenty years later, that same boy is a detective on the Dublin Murder Squad, and he's called to that same scene of the crime to investigate a new murder, chillingly similar to the still unsolved one that he was a victim of. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today my friend Lisa Marie Cabrelli is back to talk to me about this first of six Dublin Murder Squad books. Lisa Marie just finished her PhD in creative writing, and she wrote her thesis on this series. Now, she got me hooked on Tana French several years ago, and of all the books I talked to her about, and we talk books all the time, this series is my favorite because she has incredible insight and she always makes me see them differently. I know you're going to love hearing her tell me why In the Woods is the best book ever. Hi, Lisa Marie. Welcome back to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, Julie. Great to be here. Let's start with, tell me your history with crime fiction in general. I had a period, I think, when I was probably in my 20s when I was crime fiction obsessed, reading reading wise. And I was particularly obsessed with Elizabeth George. Do you know her books? She's the ins- Inspector Lindley? Yeah. Yes. This was before it was on TV or anything, but I was completely obsessed with her books. And then I kind of went off crime fiction for a really long time and didn't read it. And then I started reading it again because when we moved to Scotland to look after my husband's mother and because I was going to be here for a year, it's been five years now, but it was only supposed to be a year. I was just looking for something to do while I was there. And there was a master's program at Dundee University, which is quite an esteemed university in, in Scotland in crime writing and forensic investigation. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. So I applied just, you know, on a whim and I got in. So I started this master's program and started reading crime fiction again as part of the master's program. And that's when I started reading Town of French. But you were already a writer. Was it already kind of in the back of your head that you wanted to attempt a crime fiction novel? Yeah. I mean, I thought that writing a crime fiction novel would be really fun, but I was pretty like fixed on writing a chick lit rom-com. And I really, really enjoyed that. But then I thought, well, it'd be fun to learn something new. And I've never had any proper education in writing before. And so I'll, I'll try this crime fiction course. Basically what it taught me is I don't want to write crime fiction. (laughs) <laughs> but <laughs> why I'm a real plotter so you would think I would love it right because it's really really plot driven but I found it kind of restrictive I thought for me because it's so plot driven it's really easy to find yourself writing into a corner even after you've outlined and I have a book I wrote a book as part of the course it was one of the requirements of writing a novel so I have a novel but it needs to, it needs an edit. And I enjoyed writing it, but I just, and I thought as I was writing it, oh, this is great. I'm going to do a whole series. I have all these ideas. But then when I was finished, I thought, you know what? I really enjoy the easy, free, freer writing of, of women's fiction and, and, you know, and chick lit. Well, let's tell our listeners who maybe haven't come across Tanner French. Can you sort of give an overview of, of the series as it exists? Sure. I mean, one of the things about Tana French that I find so enticing is that she is a genre breaker, right? So crime fiction has very, very fixed history of rules. I mean, most all genres do, right? And one of the main rules of crime fiction, not necessarily a rule, but one of the more contemporary occurrences in crime fiction is that authors will choose a static character. So the narrative arc 
of of most crime fiction happens outside of the character. The character is pretty static and the character, the main detective will journey from one book to the next, basically unchanged, right? So think like Ian Rankin or Elizabeth George, all those people who have a single character who may be flawed, who may have issues, but is doesn't really have a, a, a character arc. And they are kind of like the 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 linchpin of the series like Sherlock Holmes right is where mm-hmm. it sort of started Poirot yeah Poirot but Tana French does not take that genre approach Tana French in the Dublin Murder Squad chooses a different detective for every for the focus of of every book writes it in first person point of view which is really unique because most crime fiction is written in third person. Very difficult to write crime fiction in first person point of view because then you only get the perspective of the detective and crime fiction requires like a lot of stuff going on, right? A lot of pieces that you have to put together. So that's the first thing that she does. And then the most fascinating part of her books is that she gives each of these first person point of view detectives a really strong character arc throughout each novel. So each novel on its own, although the detectives are all related because they all come from the Dublin murder squad, each novel is completely standalone. Like you could read each novel without ever having read any of the other novels and you haven't really missed anything. Some of the things that keeps me going back to the Chief Inspector Gamache series by Louise Penny is that I love Gamash so much. And yeah. I know that I know that his solid character, no matter what happens to him, that his very solid, he's he's established as a very good human. Yeah. And even as terrible things are happening to him and around him, I want to see how this very good human handles some pretty ugly situations. And I'm attached to him. I mean, I'm attached to the entire town, of course. But I'm mostly attached to him. So how, what do you think draws us back to the Dublin murder squad when we are not, we don't get to stick with this one character? What do you think it is that she's doing that's drawing us into the series as a whole? Is it the, is it the institution of the Dublin murder squad that we're in love with? Well, I think that there's two things. Tana French does something really, really smart. And that is in every book, you develop a relationship with one character and then another character, right? The secondary character. Mm -hmm. So although you're experiencing, let's take In the Woods, for example, Rob's journey, like, you know, from beginning to end, you also are building this really strong relationship and this attachment to Cassie Maddox, right? Who, for those who haven't read the book, is Rob's partner. Mm -hmm. And also something happens to Cassie within the book that makes you really attached to her and really want the best for her. And so when I found out that the second book was told from the perspective of Cassie, I really, really wanted to read that book. So even if you haven't developed a super strong relationship with them, you know enough to be curious about them. And the other Mm -hmm. part, the, the deeper part of, of the Dublin Murder Squad is this thematic, th- this theme that underlines all of the books that makes them all an exploration of the same issue, right? So Tana French's books are, even Tana French herself says, crime fiction is about an exploration of national identity, right? Ooh. So- I'm knocked over by that sentence and it is, I'm immediately clicking through my favorite crime writers all have a very strong sense of the country of origin, which is Tana French, Chief Inspector Gamache, which is Canadian, which is very specifically Canadian. The concern is always murder, of course, but very specifically, how does this affect us as Canadians? And my third favorite crime writer is Jane Harper, who writes those Australian Australian. Outback. And same thing. It's it's always dealing with the murder, but they're very specifically Australian situations. And who, what does this mean? We are, 
what does this situation mean for us as Australians? Yes. Oh, I love this observation very much. I never thought of it like that before. So Tana French's books are not just about the individual detectives. They are about Ireland, right? And so there might not be the linchpin of a character, but there is a linchpin of theme. Mm-hmm. The theme for the, of which is the struggle for identity, which is in every single one. So Ireland itself is experiencing or has experienced an identity crisis, right? And at the same time, each of Tana French's protagonists in every single book is mirroring the identity crisis that is experienced in Ireland. Can you tell me how so? Ireland has has suffered this really troubled past. It it was colonialized. They had the potato famine. They they were an agricultural community. They've they've had all these like really str- struggles as a country, right? In different points in history. And in an effort to like move beyond this like traumatic experience, Ireland has like tried on different identities. And for Ireland, this was this boom period during the turn of last the last century. And in the narrative arc of Irish Irish history, the it's a traumatic event that exposes that this identity that they have tried on is just a fraud, right? It's just it's not a real identity. So for Ireland, it was the it was the Celtic Tiger. Right, that that was the identity that they tried on at the turn mm-hmm. of the last century, and then the global economic crash, which was this traumatic experience, exposed the fact that this this identity, this Celtic Tiger identity, wasn't really true or sustainable, or wasn't a foundational identity, and that's exactly what happens in for every one of her protagonists. I wrote in my dissertation, Laura Miller, who, who's a writer for the New Yorker said that in Tana French's novel, the search for the killer becomes entangled with this search for self, Mm. right? And in most crime fiction, the central mystery is who is the murderer. But in French's novels, it's who is the detective. So the whole narrative arc for each protagonist becomes a search for identity. So, And it's mirrored in this tragic Ireland. So for Rob, Ireland tries on this identity for as, as a Celtic tiger right? Rob, as the protagonist, tries on this identity as a detective. I mean, we learn about Rob's past and we know that he he is try, he actually has a fake identity, right? His name is not Rob, mm-hmm. right? You, you learn that in the book. And so he has this fake identity. And in the books, the traumatic event is always the murder, that is the same thing as the global economic crisis, right? Which sets off the prota- for the protagonist in French's novels, this real crisis of identity. And during this crisis of identity, they betray themselves, just as Ireland was betrayed, right? So Ireland was betrayed after the, the, the global economic crash. A couple of other things happened in Ireland. The, the Catholic Church was exposed for all of the horrible things that that were happening to children at that time. And also the government of Ireland was exposed as betraying their people because they encouraged the Irish people to jump on this Celtic Tiger bandwagon. And a lot of people lost their life savings and they lost their homes. And, you know, it was a real horrible time because they were betrayed. And the detectives betrayed themselves. Like Rob betrays himself several ways in the book. Can you tell our listeners the plot of this one the, and the, the two mysteries that are yes. going on? Let's talk about the setting as well, yes. because the setting of In the Woods is absolutely amazing. And that's where some of her most beautiful writing is. Can I just say about Tana French that like one of the main reasons I love her, apart from all the other things we've been talking about, is that her prose is mm-hmm. just so beautiful. So it's set in the woods, obviously. And it's set in the woods during a period, during the, probably during the the Celtic Tiger period of Ireland, where they are trying to build a new motorway through the woods. And what they discover is that there's like a Neolithic settlement, right? Right where they're going to build the motorway through the woods, right next to the old housing estate 
where Rob lives. So that's that's the setting. And you see the motorway becomes like a metaphor for this Celtic tiger, right? Because the motorway is just rushing across the country, obscuring all the past and, you know, even the pre- obscuring the present. And all the benefits of this motorway sit squarely like with the landowners, which is such a colonial perspective, right? Nobody else is going to benefit from this motorway coming through. And, and the class divide, right, is mm-hmm. also mirrored mm-hmm. in this setting because it sits right next to this housing estate. I think Rob says it was like shaky land deals. It was just all given up. So Rob grew up in this housing estate with two really, really good friends, a girl and a, a boy. And what happens in the beginning of the book is they find the body of a 13-year-old girl in the woods where Rob used to play as a child, murdered. And that's when he gets called onto the scene. And the difficult thing for Rob is that he, as a child, used to play in those woods with his two friends. And one day when he was out playing, his two friends disappeared. And Rob, who wasn't Rob at the time, he had a different name. I can't remember what his name was. Can you remember? Adam was his first name. Rob is his middle name. Adam was discovered tied to a tree with his shoes filled with blood and completely traumatized and not talking. And they never, ever found his two friends. So he has this huge traumatic event in his past, huge. And he has completely put that aside. He has no memory of it, put it aside he was sent off to boarding school right after this happened at 12 years old. How traumatic. Sent away from his parents, sent away from his family to boarding school, had his identity changed. And then he joins the Dublin murder squad. So he doesn't tell anyone that he's Adam. So he, because he doesn't want to get kicked off the case. Because as he starts working on this case, all of these memories that he's lost sort of start to prickle in his brain and he starts to think that he might remember things. But again, this is like Tana French mirroring, you know, mirroring the thematic experience of Ireland again. He's hiding this traumatic past. He's put it aside and he's become this complete new identity with zero foundation. And the murder happens. And when the murder happens, just like when the, the the crash happened, the economic crash happened, everything is thrown up into the air because all of a sudden he's standing in his past in the exact same woods where this mysterious thing happened and there's been a girl murdered. And he can't, there's even moments where like as he's walking into the woods and he looks at this 13 year old, he thinks, is, is this one of my friends? I mean, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever because he's like in mm. his 40s now, or whatever, you mm-hmm. know, 30s, or whatever. So it can't possibly be one of his friends. But in his brain, he's like totally thrown back into this trauma that he's been ignoring and built a whole identity ignoring it, right? Yes. So this traumatic event, th- this traumatic event that happened, you know, this inciting event that happens, which is the murder, and it is in every book launches his struggle for identity. So he doesn't tell anyone that he that he is Adam because he knows he'll get thrown off the case. The only person who knows is Cassie, who's his partner, and she won't doesn't tell anyone. But he starts investigating the case, thinking that it might possibly have a link to his case when he was a child. So that's how the the book begins. So tell me what you think about his character arc through the through this book? Well, Rob says at the very beginning of the book, which I love, he says, every detective is a liar. Mm -hmm. And all of detective work is built on lies. So he's basically telling you that he isn't who you think he is. Like right from the very beginning. Yeah, I think that's chapter one. It's very destabilizing, isn't it? It is because you think, oh, okay, this is an unstable, unreliable narrator. Right. Mm-hmm. You think that immediately. And and uh, like I was saying before about like my attachment to Gamache, like we tend to go into crime fiction thinking the one person we can trust yeah. is this main point of view person who is leading the investigation. That's that's our rock of this story. And what's funny about him is he just says it straight off the bat. I lie. 
My entire said, job is built on lies. Yeah, exactly. But one of the things he doesn't admit is that he is lying to himself. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he really understands how deeply he is lying to himself. So Rob's character arc is, you know, you, you expect a redemption arc, right? That's kind of what you feel like you're going to get from mm -hmm. the very beginning. You don't get that. Because at the end, he's still struggling. In fact, even worse. And that's, again, reflective of Tana French's experience in Ireland. Her commentary on the national identity of Ireland is they still haven't figured it out. And that theme is so strong. It links together every single one of the books. Because in the end, the detectives, they may or may not mm -hmm. solve the crime. That, I think, is the biggest diversion, or as you called it, genre breaker. Yeah. This is my second time through this book. And when I started, I assumed we're going to get two answers. We're and I always think that what we like about crime fiction is the resolution. That's the satisfying mm -hmm. part. So if the she's tidy clearing up. Yes. So if she's yep. taking away that tidiness. It's a failed redemption arc, which is a real genre breaker. Yes. Especially in crime fiction. But it's but it doesn't. I know people who found it very dissatisfying and actually didn't go on with the rest of the books because they were primarily crime fiction readers. But I think that Tana French is a genre blender. She's a literary mm -hmm. writer mm -hmm. writing crime fiction novels. And so she su very successfully breaks genre rules because she is very strong from the literary perspective. With genre fiction, it's all about marketing. And it was marketed very clearly as a crime novel. Mm. And I think that crime novel, crime fiction readers have very, very clear expectations. And Tana French didn't meet them. She's kind of said, you know, screw you to the expectations of her readers, which I freaking love. But I love crime fiction because I'm not a crime, you know, like I'm not the kind of genre reader who only reads one genre and expects everything to happen the way that it should happen in a genre. Like, I, you know, I don't, there's so many people who are like that, right? The romance readers, they're like, you know, sure. I mean, it's the same story over and over again. And if you break it, they're really, really angry. Yes. You know, but because I read so much in so many different genres, I don't really have an attachment to those tropes. And that's why I loved this book because I thought it was so much deeper than, I mean, there's a lot of really great f crime fiction out there, don't get me wrong. But I thought this one was like so much deeper than, and the whole series, yeah, you know, so much deeper than the other stuff that I read. She's playing chess and the rest of us are can barely figure out the checkers board. Exactly. And, you know, there's like a part of me that says, I wonder if she knows she's doing this, but it's absolutely <laughs> impossible for her not to know what she's doing. Yeah. Because honestly, Julie, when you sit down to write, do you think, oh, I'm going to write, you know, I'm going to keep to a single theme of the Irish struggle for a national identity? No. You know what I mean? Not like, for genre fiction, but I have 100% done that when I try to write literary fiction where I am really thinking about big, big themes. But applying it to genre fiction and the established rules of genre fiction is mind-blowing to me. Mind-blowing. With, with the skill and the prose. Yes. Can I just read you my favorite part? Yes, Sorry. please do. So this part of the book, I'm, the only reason I picked it out is because it, I think it really illustrates her prose and, and the, emote, the emotional, like, the the ability she has to like induce em an emotional reaction through her through her prose and it and this is just like such a simple thing what happens is is the 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 girlfriend Jamie was was going to be sent away to to boarding school mm -hmm. and it was ruining their summer right this was before the the event it, it, Peter, Adam, and and Jamie spend every summer together in the woods. 
And Jamie was going to be sent away to boarding school and it was ruining their summer. So this passage, it says, we were all yelling at the same time and it took a few seconds before I figured out what Jamie was shouting. I'm staying. I'm staying. I don't have to go. The summer came to life. It burst from gray to fierce blue and gold in the blink of an eye. The air peeled with grasshoppers and lawnmowers, swirled with branches and bees and dandelion seeds. It was soft and sweet as whipped cream, and over the wall the wood was calling us in the loudest of silent voices. It was shaking out all its best treasures to welcome us home. Summer tossed out a fountain of ivy tendrils, caught us straight under the breastbone and tugged. Summer redeemed and unfurling in front of us a million years long. Wasn't that so beautiful? I read that. That was one of the ones I stopped to read to Mark because I was like, oh my God, I feel that. Like mm-hmm. I feel, I feel like their, their ch- childhood. I feel their age. I feel their joy. I feel the setting, you know, it was right at the beginning, you know, yes. when you're thinking about that whole environment. It's juicy, isn't it? It's ju- <laughs> That's exactly the right word. That's why it's so fun to read her books. One thing I want to ask you about Rob is, I think we're meant to like him and dislike him at the same yes. time. It is obvious he should not be on this case. From page one, every rational person, I think, would look at it and say, the, p- the place where your two best friends were murdered and it is unsolved. If another murder happens there, you are not the right person. Yep. And we all know this. And that he worked so hard to keep it secret tells us that he also knows he should not be on this. He is not the right detective for this case. And then what happens between him and Cassie. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what Tana French does that helps us like him is she establishes his trauma very, very clearly. Yes. Like you understand that he's a broken man. Right. And then secondly, she, even though it's written in first person point of view from Rob, she shows us Rob, first of all, through Cassie's eyes and Cassie just adores him. Mm -hmm. And we adore Cassie. Yes. Yes. So we think, well, we adore Cassie. If she sees him, he must be redeemable. And I think like is the wrong word. I don't necessarily need to like a main character, but what I definitely have for him is tremendous empathy. Yeah. And sympathy. And I do want him to have a redemption. I do want him to be healed from this. Yeah. And I, I think it, I have so much admiration for how she was able to elicit that when, if I had to work with this guy and I found out this secret that he had been keeping, Mm -hmm. I would be furious. And what if you were Cassie's friend and you found out what he did to Cassie? Yep. He's not a good guy. But maybe that's why she went with first person, because if we went third person through this, we would have that remove, that extra level of remove. And yeah. It would be very easy to stop caring about Rob, completely stop. Yeah, but the, his backstory that she feeds to you so carefully mm-hmm. elicits that empathy that you do. I'm like, I want him to be saved. And then she continues that by ending it with this absolute seamless film noir ending. Yeah, it's it's not a redemption. <laughs> no. In, no. Any, in any way, nobody really gets what's coming to them. That's something else that people were angry about as well, because that breaks the genre. Mm-hmm. Is it really in the end of a crime fiction novel, you should see the person responsible behind bars. Right. Or or someone else would take retribution. I think I think Tana no. French is saying not everyone gets punished. We want them yeah. to. And crime fiction has made us all think that every bad guy's going to get their due, but we all know they don't. Right. Well, again, you and then you could go back again to what we were saying earlier about the Irish identity and the, what the government did to their 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 people. I mean, maybe that's a reflection of that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? The government got away with it. Everybody at that level who took all your money 
They got away with it. Yeah. And all these and all these politicians and all these people who did this horrible stuff and all the priests and everybody in the Catholic Church who screwed you over. And kept their jobs. And kept their jobs. They're all out there walking around free. Mm-hmm. I want to read it again. I want to just start this. I really do. <laughs> After this conversation, I just, I'm going to skip work today. I'm just going to, I'm just going to start this book again. I'm going to start the whole series again. I love this series. God, it's so good. Tana French, I know you're a fan of the show. Please keep writing. We love you. Please come on the show and tell us what your best book ever is. I would really like to hear that. Wouldn't it be great to just talk to her and and have one of those off the record conversations and say, okay, tell me the truth. Who really did kill <laughs> Just tell us. Just I won't tell anybody. Please just yeah, tell but me. Maybe she doesn't know. I bet she does. I bet she does. She's she so she's so high level. I don't think she would introduce something. I'm talking like I know her. I, she is most definitely a plotter that mm-hmm. I know. No, it's too intricate. Yep. That's the thing about crime fiction, right? Why I said to you, like, it's so hard to write. So will you tell us what you're reading right now? I just bought at the bookstore today, Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. What is it? The reason I bought it is because I, on my trip to the Antarctica, did I tell you I went to Antarctica? I did not. You did not tell me this. (laughs) I didn't tell you anything. What pictures? What was wrong with me? I bought a, I, I never, ever read magazines and I bought one for the airplane. And Anne Patchett was in there, who I absolutely adore, recommending her favorite book of the year. And it was this one. I just bought it today. I haven't started it yet. So this is what I'm going to be reading next. It's been shortlisted, shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction. Oh, nice. Also, she owns a bookstore. So ah. I have a feeling that she, yeah. she says it's good. She means it. She knows yeah. books. She's another list of friend of mine gave to me just recently and I read the first one she just said to me like I said I always ask people what like are your 10 favorite books can you send me your list and she sent me your list and I read the first one and it was so good wait hang on I have to ask you it's like when you you ask people to send you to tell you their 10 favorite books just to add to your own list yes do people love being asked that I bet they do yes of course they do. They oh. really want to tell you their 10 favorite books. Do you ask it right when you meet people or do you wait till you get close to No, them? no, <laughs> no, I don't do that. <laughs> oh, it was called This Must Be the Place. Maggie O'Farrell. Mm-hmm. You know her? I do. That was the first book of hers I read. First book of mine. I just, I now I want to go read every single Maggie O'Farrell now. She is magical. I just finished Hamnet. Which is I oh yes I've heard of that oh my god it is so good I was a sobbing weeping puddle at the end oh good that sounds good she I'm going to go read that one next because I I said once I read that one this was on her list of ten favorite books I was like okay now I have to go read every single Maggie O'Farrell this must be the place was like every chapter was a short story Mm -hmm. like they could all have been printed as literary short stories separately. Yes. It was so beautiful. Yes, I agree. No, she, I think, is absolutely the best we've got right now. One of the best we've got. She's just an incredible writer. I don't know why I haven't read anything by her before, but she's, she's on my list. weirdly under the radar. Although I saw Hamnet everywhere. And I think so did I. Maybe yeah. because it was such a pretty cover that Bookstagram and Book Talk really sort of took hold of it. But she's just an incredible writer yeah i love very, very this must be the place we like the same books i think i really think we do every time you recommend a book to me i get obsessed with it. <laughs> <laughs> like severance last year like severance which i also was just thinking i want to reread that <laughs> and i don't you know, have my... time to keep rereading all these books no, but I you know. always recommend the books that are so good on rereading. And that's the thing with this one as well. I loved In the Woods the first time through and the reread was even better. Knowing knowing what she can do, knowing her skill and knowing how it's going to end yeah. changes the entire way Everything. you read it. Yeah. Yeah. But if I keep rereading, I don't have time to keep going. <laughs> I'm amazed at how many books you read. I, I, I'm, I'm reti- semi-retired and I can't read that many books. 
It's not enough though. I wish I could just, I wish I could just read all day. That would be nice. (laughs) (laughs) So will you please share with our guests where they can find you? Sure. I am just, I've just finished a PhD in creative writing. So for a long time, I haven't released because I've been working on the PhD, which is kind of all consuming. But as part of my PhD in creative writing, I did write a dystopian fiction novel. And it was actually all, the first draft was written pre-COVID, but it Mm -hmm. actually is about a virus. So that it's post-apocalyptic and dystopian. So it's just a book I've always wanted to write. So that book is coming out on the Yonder platform. Yonder is a reading app where they release the book chapter by chapter. Like, so they release the chapters as kind of episodes. And also I'm starting a new series, a post PhD series, and I'm going to be releasing that chapter by chapter. And we will put a link to that in the show notes as well, so that listeners can subscribe to that and see your work. Lisa Marie, I want to thank you for joining me today. It is my favorite thing in the world to talk books with you. Every time I talk books with you, I want to go back and reread the book that we have just talked about because you always change my perspective on it and you always see so deeply into books. And it's just so wonderful to talk to you. So thank you for joining me. I hope you'll come back anytime you have another book to talk to me about. Anytime you want me to, I'm happy to come back. And it's really lovely chatting books with you. We would do this all day if we could. Bookworms, I can't wait to hear if you've read any ton of French books and what you think of them. Let me know over on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. Links to everything Lisa Marie and I discussed are available in the show notes. Subscribe to my brand new weekly pod newsletter at bestbookeverpodcast.substack.com. You'll learn more about my weekly guests and get a little peek into what I'm reading and listening to and obsessing over. Thanks for joining me today. And as always, I will see you at the library.